Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Subtext Podcast Archives. These are the long lost episodes of the Subtext that were originally produced between 2015 and 2017. In 2018, the Subtext moved to American Theatre Magazine, and we've been producing the pod there monthly ever since. These time capsules are being shared here in their entirety, including plenty of outdated references and advertisements for events far in the past. If you enjoy them, please subscribe to the current podcast feed for the subtext or stream new episodes on the website for American Theatre Magazine. Thank you for listening. I recently saw a play with a friend. Afterwards, we both agreed it was a fine production, but the play... The play was nothing original. We'd seen that story before. I got to thinking how I haven't seen something truly original in a thousand years, and I yearn for something new, different, unique... Original. I'm sick of playwrights churning out the same stories over and over again, so I decided to give you, my playwright friends, some advice on what not to write. This list may be incomplete. Let's start with plays about love, that wah 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 plays about the man or the woman or the human or the alien, teacher or boss or, or, or the sandwich you loved and you couldn't love you back. Forget unrequited love forever. Forget requited love, for that matter. Forget young love, old love, new love, the Romeo and Juliet's love, been done and done and done and done and done. How about loss, then? Lost jobs, lost pets, lost hope, lost keys, lost mom and dad. Oh, how about that? Moms and dads have been played out. We don't need another play about mommy and daddy issues. Your issues are the same as everybody else's issues. War? Please, go read the history plays. Go read the Greeks. And how close have you been to war? What do you know about it? Write about prison or drug addiction, homelessness or mental illness, or, or, or losing a limb, terminal sickness? Got it. Thank you. Move on. Hey, it's 2016. Maybe we should write about technology, social media, electric cars, robots, internet, life on Mars, or farther out into the universe, or to some other universe and write a play about life on a planet so far away it's exactly like here but all the colors are gray. Your idea's done, and done better than you can even imagine. Math plays, history plays, pick your favorite, least favorite high school class play, maybe about your sports team, or a meta play about the drama club debate team spelling bees. Thank you. Next. You can write about the moments from your life you found to be the most intense, exhilarating, hilarious, heartbreaking. They must be original because yours, they're yours, but guess what, friend? They're interesting to only you. So keep it in a journal. You know what? Plays with music. Make your play, which is like every other play, just a tad different by throwing in a song. Make it all a song and have them dance a little. Have them dance a lot. Make it a play about a piece of our past we all forgot. The man on the $4 bill. Take your shot, but first Google it. The last original idea has been got. In short, if you want to be sure your idea is original, think about this. Do you have an idea? If so, then it's not. If you can get past that, then write out your heart, write whatever you comes to your mind, write until your eyes bleed, but just know somebody else is writing the same thing at the same time and doing it better and it's about to premiere at that theater and you've got nothing to show for your blood-soaked computer. So do something else. Do something mundane. Release yourself from that urge to speak your truth. That'll keep you sane. Feel the peace that follows and punch the clock at work for 40 years. Then move to the beach, and live out your remaining days without the weight on your shoulders of a lifetime of unproduced, unoriginal plays. Unless, of course, you don't care what people think. In which case, go write whatever you want, about anything you want, set any place you want. Fuck originality. Do what you want to do. It's original, if it's original to you. Welcome to the Subtext, the world's only playwright interview podcast hosted by me. A couple of things before we get to this month's interview. First, thank you for listening. I appreciate all the positive feedback we've received about this endeavor. If you know anybody who might be interested in this sort of thing, please share it with them. 
Uh, also, I've neglected to shout out International Pen Pal, who provided our theme song. Check out their one and only album on iTunes. Now, this month's guest is Ruth McKee, author of the play In Case of Emergency, currently being staged in garages around the greater Los Angeles area. Seriously, in garages. Check it out. Here's Ruth. I don't know why I find yogurt tubes. Like, it, <laughs> it makes me laugh. <laughs> Just, I don't know if it's the combination of words or just yogurt in a tube in general. Yeah. It's just so... Well, that's what I signed up to bring, so. <laughs> of course. <laughs> what would be a graduation without uh, yogurt tubes? Exactly. Where are the yogurt tubes? Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so that was my morning. <laughs> that's not a bad morning, no, I guess. No, no. I mean, I guess, I guess there could be more more stressful things to be happening. Well, it's like all of, you know, the last couple weeks of school for the kids and then um, are there are all these additional activities and performances and things that you're suddenly expected to be there for and at the same time you're scrambling to actually prepare for a period of time when you don't have childcare mm-hmm. over the summer and it's like it just seems totally unfair for mm-hmm. you know all these performances and graduations should be another time i'm i'm scrambling right now to you know, prepare for summer i think actually this is something that's been interesting in over the course of doing this this podcast, I think this has been this is our I think this is our thirteenth episode. Mm-hmm. So we, so it's a, a little over a year now, and uh, many of the people who have come in to talk to me uh, are parents, mm-hmm. and it's been super interesting to just listen to the different stories about balancing parenthood and playwriting, yeah. or just being a parent in general and how that impacts your everyday life, whether you're a writer or not. Yeah. How how does it how does it impact you as a writer? <laughs> well, I mean, it's definitely slowed me down um, in terms of my in terms of the number of scripts that I've written or you know number of plays that I've been able to do. Um, I would say the first. Um, so when when Alec was born, uh, I was in the middle of. Uh, trying to get this place stray off the ground. And um, we did a production here in L.A. It was a co-production between Chalk Rep and the Block Dahlia Theater. Mm-hmm. Um, and when that went up, I was five months pregnant. So it was totally reasonable. Um, and then uh, and then during that production, I got selected for the Cherry Lane Mentor Project in New York. Um, and then they called and they said, congratulations. And it was, I was going to be mentored by David Henry Wong. And it was mm-hmm. really a dream come true moment in terms of, you know, it's one of those, the mentor project is one of those um, programs that as a young playwright, you're like, oh, if I could just get into this, then. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, then absolutely. then I will have a national, my name will have some kind of national recognition and it'll catapult me to. Um, Fame and fortune. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I was really, um, I was really lucky. It was a, that year I was also doing Center Theater Group's um, Playwrights Workshop mm-hmm. where they um, bring a six or seven writers a year to develop a play over the course of the year. And CTG are the ones who actually nominated it for the Cherry Lane. So, um so I knew that was happening when I filled out the nomination forms in, I think it was like June or July. I knew I was pregnant, but I wasn't quite telling everyone yet. So I just sort of, I looked at this and I said, oh, this timing is so terrible. I'm probably going to get this, right? Right. Yeah, of course. This is when you would get it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So I so I got it and David Henry Wong selected my play and they were like, okay, so... Um, they, you know, we need you to fly out here for the announcements party and for a master class with Edward Albee. Obviously, I'm not going to turn these things down. Well, these sound like terrible, terrible things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think I was about seven months pregnant when I went out for those. And then, they, and then the dates they gave me for the production, I was going to have a five-week-old baby. Um, wow. And they wanted me in rehearsal. In New York. In New York with a five-week-old. And were you living in L.A. at the time? I was living yeah. in L.A. So I said, sure. I Well, first I asked 
you know, I asked my mom and I asked uh, Angelina Fiordalisi, who's their artistic director, who's a mother, and, you know, and she was like, listen, you should be able to do it. Um, and um, my mom said I should be able to do it. And she was, uh, Angelina was totally accommodating of the baby and rehearsal and um, everyone at the Cherry Lane was wonderful. But, but yeah, I was in rehearsal with the, with the newborn, um, which was fine. I wrote a new scene. It made the play better because um, the play was all about parenting and um, Ameri- parenting culture in America and um, – and not having support <laughs> and all these and did you so. write this play while you were pregnant? No, I wrote it before. I wrote it several years before. It was about my fear about becoming a <laughs> a parent, I think. Um so so yeah, uh Did your did the fears that you wrote about in the play ever manifest in real in real life? Well, yes and no. It's really interesting. So that that particular play is about um uh a white Kenyan woman and a white American man who bring a Ugandan orphan to live in the Midwest, um, and he's traumatized by war, um, and uh, he uh, is just, they just sort of throw him into the American schooling system, assuming that he will be taken care of, you know, that, and the, that the, the teacher and the school therapist and the principal will will figure this out um and sort of in that it takes a village mentality that it, where they come from there was a large support network of people and they just sort of taken in the, the place called stray is sort of they had sort of taken in this boy mm-hmm. kind of like a stray not thinking about parenting in this sort of larger commitment to um a child the way that we now do at least in um the educated classes in, in mm-hmm. America. Um, so they hadn't really thought through the commitment in taking this kid. They were just sort of like, oh, well, we're moving back. And we're, or at least the, the wife hadn't, the African wife hadn't. The, the American man had different expectations and, and expectations of how, the, um, of how his wife would behave when she was an American mother, too. Um, so that's the, the heart of the play. And the boy's never seen. It's all about the adults sort of... Um, talking about him um the one thing that i think about all the time with that play is it's basically the the mother story the the white kenyan woman who um has to come to terms with what it's going to mean for her to be a mother in america um and at the end of the play she actually decides to take the boy back to africa with her because she decides that she can be a she's willing to be a mother but not not the way that it is currently presented to her in America. Um, so there's a, the, the, the scene in the play that uh, really, um, that was always the heart of the play to me is this conversation between the mother and the therapist who become really good friends. Um, and the therapist says to, the, to, says to the mother, she says, um, parenthood is is not a fair thing. It's not, I give this energy, my child gives back smiles and presents. It's give, 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 enjoy the giving. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the crux of the play, and that's the moment the mother sort of figures out, okay, well, I can do this, but not here. Um, Anyway, I have found that to be entirely true. I have, entirely untrue as a parent. I have found that- Finding the joy in giving? Well, there is joy in giving, but I have found it to be entirely a fair thing. Like, oh, okay. I give energy to my children, they give me back smiles and presents. Mm-hmm. Like, literal smiles, presents. I am showered. My son is constantly saying, you know, here's here's an infinity box of kisses. Like, they're so affectionate. There's so many smiles and presents given to me. Um, it's fair. But you have to decide, like, how much energy do I have for them? And how much do I want to keep for this um, weird little career that I've chosen for myself, right? The thing is, but is that, is that that doesn't sound like a knowable thing? Like, like, yeah. can you can you answer that question? How much energy do I have? Like, I feel like you just the reserves appear, or they don't appear, right. When the time comes, right? And I I do feel like, and perhaps I'm wrong. I do feel like if I were to give up all my own hopes and dreams and be a 
stay-at-home mom and give them all my energy, they would continue to give me smiles and pr- like that mm-hmm. is um, that it does seem fair in that way. So I feel like that line was wrong, and I think about it a lot. Um, the question, the larger question that I ask myself now is what kind of adult am I modeling for them, right? Because I don't want to model an adult who gives up all her earlier aspirations now that she has children. Mm -hmm. I want to model an adult who continues to pursue a passion and Mm -hmm. pursue a career and and a dream. So um, Uh, so I'm not just going to abandon everything. I'm going to come and talk to you and right <laughs> and well and the I, I think party. I've known I've known you or I've known who you are at least for for four or five years probably mm-hmm. and I f- feel like I've known you as somebody who has consistently been writing and having plays out there so you have oh, that's a great impression so from what I could see <laughs> there's never been a moment I mean you you We'll talk about this probably, but you did move to Indiana for a period of time. Yes. Right? Yes. Um, but it has seemed like there hasn't been a moment where you were no longer a writer. Yeah. No, I don't think that's true. I don't think there's been a moment where I was I felt no longer as a writer. Oh, I was going to say. so. Or no longer writing, no longer yeah, creating. Yeah. I, I, would de- well, I would say my productivity has been reduced. Um quite a bit and that's partly by choice what I that was a roundabout way of saying that that I I'm choosing to give a large amount of energy to my children and then only so much to my writing mm-hmm. um and uh you know I just because partly because I feel like my writing will um always be there um and I think when I was younger I had this sense of like uh, okay, if I get if I write, I have to write this next play because I want to get into this opportunity because I want to get this agent because I want to get to X Y Z with my career and I have to get my career off its feet and launched at by a certain age or you know and now I'm just sort of like I don't even know what any of that means anymore. Um, I feel like I've got a good uh, well my son is six now so I've got twelve more years of him in my house. Like, that is Mm -hmm. precious. That Mm -hmm. is precious time right now. So the writing can wait um, until that moment. This momentary thing of parenthood is over. So six years ago, this opportunity came at Cherry Lane, and you had this expectation that it was going to launch you, (laughs) right? Yeah. Was there a launch? Did you feel that that moment led to something? No, it was a great production. It was a fantastic production. Um, it was sold out. Uh, the Cherry Lane Theater audiences loved it. I had so many great, you know, people coming up to me and um, telling me how thrilled they were with the play. And um, and and then it didn't lead to any further productions. Uh, the, it was published, and I think another small company in upstate New York did the play. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that was a really good lesson for me, and I think that has always been the case, but it was the first time I really, really came to realize that was the case, that there's no such thing as a um, uh, a, a ladder or a staircase mm-hmm. with this in this career that we're in. There's no, this production will lead to x y and z there's only the show itself and there's only that it's it's about make having this production that you are doing and making it as good as it can be and never having any expectation of it bringing you anything more than it is so you you have to have full satisfaction in, right but that's in such the show that's such a a journey to get to that point right because <laughs> because journey. you are when you're coming up you are thinking that there is a logic there's a there, yeah. are, there are these series of steps and then over time you realize the steps are like an mc escher painting <laughs> where they the, you're taking steps and they end up leading in a circle and you're like or they're leading you're just taking steps upward and then you realize two years later that you've been walking downward and you just don't realize in what direction steps are going. Right. But then see, but that's even to to suggest there are steps. You know, it's I feel like it's more like we're just like wandering a uh, wandering along a beach, you know. And there's sure, like, yeah. and it's, there's no there's no path, there's no and there's no destination either. 
there's only this moment. Mm -hmm. Um, There's only this play, this production. So, um, so that's great. That that production of Stray was great. It um, it did not lead to, you know, it was published. That was great. Um, Maybe more people have read it. I still like that play. Um, And then. Uh, that year, I was sort of to go back to where my productivity dropped off because I would say that year that I had the newborn, or that Alec, my son, was just a very easy, very portable um, little baby. He was one of, the, you know, he slept through the night. He was just like um, a model child. He still is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so he, so I, you know, that year I had a bunch of readings. Um, I, traveled with him um oh actually right after stray i came back to la and we produced a one-person show that i'd written for chalk so right after that new york experience i came back to la and a month later i was in production again um and then i got pregnant again um and i we produced uh, my play hell money again with chalk rep um in april of 2011 which was when she was born my daughter was born during the run of that play and then then my productivity dropped off so I would say I you know and and a lot of playwright friends ask me come to me with advice when they're pregnant or for advice or or, you know how do you manage this parenting and and playwriting thing and I always tell them I'm like with one kid you can Mm -hmm. do anything you can travel with one kid you can pass them off to a grandparent you can pass them off to your spouse you know there's there's so a very rich life in the theater you can live with one kid with two (laughs) (laughs) I mean no one wants to take your two kids who are going to fight with each other they'll take Anyone will take your one adorable kid. Oh, yeah. I'll babysit anybody's kid. (laughs) One. Yeah. 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 Notice there was no S at the end. I'll babysit your kid any day of the week. Yeah. Yeah. So so whatever. It's it's a trade-off. I mean, I I always intended to have children. I always intended to have two children. Um, I was intended to have them in my 30s. So it's like, in many ways, I'm living... Uh, the dream that I had for myself, uh, I just didn't quite expect that the that it would be as challenging as it is to balance um, the sort of family dream that I have with uh, with the playwriting. But the, but again, it just feels like it's so it's so short this this parenting phase of my life uh, has. Collaborating so much with Chalk been a help in that. Uh, this is a come. Well, why don't you talk about yeah. how Chalk came to be? Because sure. I think maybe that context will help in me asking the question and then you answering it. Yeah. So um, Chalk Rep is a company that I founded with uh, a group of other artists from UCSD. We had all graduated from the. MFA program there, and we'd been in LA for about well different amounts of time between us because we weren't all the same year there, um, but we'd been here two or three years, um, and we, you know, Jen, Jennifer Chang and I had been talking about producing a production of my play Stray. Um, Jennifer had also been talking with Larissa Cocorno about um, producing a production of Three Sisters. Um, and then Larissa Cocorno and Amy Ellenberger had just worked together on a production of Julia Edwards' Family Planning. So we, there were just sort of these conversations um, going on, um, producing energy. Mm-hmm. We were tired of, of sitting around waiting, to f- trying to figure out L.A. theater, waiting for opportunities to happen. And we thought, okay, well, let's just make our own company and make these productions happen and then see where it goes from there. Um and our first season, because we had all these, you know, sort of projects in the back of our minds, we we came out with a season of four plays, um, our very first year. That's and a, it, that's that's a big, <laughs> that's a bold, it's a bold move. It was it was pretty bold, um, and it was really fun. It was just like, uh, it was really fun to produce in a way that I had never really expected. Um, I I had often thought about producing 
before that, you know, before grad school, when I was in New York, I had I had been involved in some theater companies and I had spent a little um, energy towards it. But the big barrier to self-producing had always seemed to me um, two big barriers were money, you know, fundraising and um, getting that that group of people with that energy who are equally committed together because mm-hmm. um, it takes a lot of, of people to put a show up and it takes you know a lot of money too so so was your was chalk's decision to be uh, site specific focused uh, a, a decision out of budgetary needs or an aesthetic choice an aesthetic sort of yearning or is there something of both yeah I would say something of both um the with our initial we you know we all got together at Jen Chang's house for an initial brainstorming meeting and we we started sharing like what our favorite theater going events had been in recent years um our favorite things to get involved in and um and the things that keep kept coming up for us, the big thing that kept coming up for us with, was intimacy. Um, and that's the thing that, you know, I really love an intimate theatrical experience. And I really feel like um, that is the one thing that theater, well, there are many, there are many things theater can bring that film can. But that's the thing that, that a theater brings me that a filmed or televised experience never can with the actor right there across from me. Um, There's nothing better than that. So I personally have very little interest in seeing theater in big Broadway houses or, you know, Pantages or the Mm -hmm. Amundsen. That, That really... I love a good, you know, big musical as much as the next person, but... I really have never gotten excited about those kinds of, of theatrical experiences. For me, it's all about um, having the actor up close. Mm-hmm. So that, I think, was a big uh, jumping off point. The other thing was that it, w- it was 2008, um, and we were starting a theater company in the middle of a recession, mm-hmm. um, and we did want to do work as cheaply as we could, and... Uh, not renting space, not building sets, not um, hanging lights. That is just such a huge help to the bottom line. So we were able to pay actors from the first production. Our, you know, our budgets have largely been built on, you know, paying actors and mm-hmm. and writers and directors, but paying artists um, rather than than spending any money on set. Um, that said, I think that that was a huge opportunity for us um, to start thinking outside of the box. Um, And Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles has two major resources as far as um, creating plays. Los Angeles has the best acting pool. Now, New Yorkers will will think this is crazy, but but the, we have the best acting pool in the country, maybe even in the world with all of the um, Brits and Australians coming over here. And they are completely bored, and this, this talent pool is lying fallow mm-hmm. and is waiting to be uh, engaged. Uh, so that's what L.A. has. And the other thing that L.A. has is space. It's a huge, sprawling metropolis with empty spaces, with empty warehouses, with houses that are only half used, with backyards, with parks. And so it's like, let's take advantage of the resources that exist in L.A. and not try to make a New York-style urban theater in Los Angeles. Because you know the er, the New York theater comes f- it's about confinement right you mm-hmm. you have you have this huge uh, overpopulated city where, where with nowhere to go so you cram people into these dark little boxes and you put on a show for them inside this dark little box well there's no reason to do that in Los Angeles and in fact when you do that to Angelinos they hate it mm-hmm. they're like why am I stuck in this dark little box it's beautiful outside so we take the theater outside where it's beautiful um, and 
Um, so yeah, it's it's I guess addressing those issues. So that so that mission came first. We're going to do plays set outside of theaters. Yes, because sometimes they are site specific and sometimes they are site off center mm-hmm. in a way. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, our tagline we came up with was. Uh, classical and contemporary plays in unconventional spaces Mm -hmm. so that they um, there's always a conversation between the play and the space but they're not always literally using the space for what it is Mm -hmm. um, because that is a little limiting yeah and and, (laughs) and it creates it really creates sort of diversity and experience and expectation in a way because sometimes you'll go to a chalk play sometimes I will go to a chalk play for example, um, Dorothy Fortenberry's play a couple years mm-hmm. ago, which was set in like a near future world uh, where, oh God, help me, uh, help yeah. me with the plot. Where, yeah, that's okay. The, where moms who had committed infractions had been sent to a rehabilitation facility. Right, and yeah. that was set in in uh, Sherman Oaks mm-hmm. in a sort of like after school yeah, it's school a, it's for like kids. Yeah, it's like a preschool ch- indoor children's play area. Yeah. So it felt it felt specific, mm-hmm. but it, I mean, it really wasn't because the world of Dorothy's play wasn't actually doesn't actually exist, thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it that one felt like a true melding of um, play and place. Yeah, you know? yeah. And what was so fantastic about that, and it it came together. The piece came together in that way also because Dorothy came to us. Um, I think she'd done one of our flash festivals and she came to us and said, uh, I want to write a play that actually gets produced. What does chalk need? Mm -hmm. And we weren't at a place where we were able to commission, but it was such a wonderful question to be asked because our, our needs in terms of scripts are very specific and playwrights are, are pitching us work all the time and we're, we're like oh this is a beautiful play but it has 12 settings and some of them are indoors and some of them are outdoors and um, it has flash but like there's just we we don't we don't create worlds in that way mm-hmm. you have to you have to help us a little bit um, so Dorothy came to us and said um, I want to write a play that you would produce what are the what are the requirements or, you know, mm-hmm. and I, and I said to her, Oh, well, we need, um, at least two great roles for women in our company, mm-hmm. uh, ideally, um, or, you know, for women in their early thirties at the time. Uh, and we need, our company has expanded and diversified. We have men in our company now too. Um, but at the time we were all, still all women. Um, and we need, um, us to it to be able to set it in a space that is available to us for cheap or free um and so Dorothy had been thinking about you know she just recently had a baby and had been thinking about this this mom culture and the way that we shame each other um and um she said well this is what I've been thinking about how about I set it in a preschool or a play area and we were like yeah that's great mm-hmm. so we hadn't found the space yet she started writing but we knew that space was um, was something we could find mm-hmm. um, and then that the place where we ended up producing Pint Size Kids in Sherman Oaks I um, was there playing with my kids one day and um, started chatting with the owner and I, I just sort of said so um, what happens after 6 o'clock right right <laughs> And she said, nothing, we shut down. And I said, okay, could we uh, rent this out for a theater performance? And, um, and she was very agreeable. This, she was probably yeah. like, a, a what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was She was totally down. So um, so we got that space. I mean, we paid them a little rent, but, but mm-hmm. it was still a very affordable production. I, I contrast that one with... Carson Kreitzer's play at Hollywood mm-hmm. Forever Cemetery, which uh, just just seemed like a a beautiful setting for a play, but mm-hmm. certainly not specific to that one. to the play. Yeah, but it was it was an incredible and beautiful and theatrical experience to sit in that space and yeah. see a play. Yeah, we had a partnership with Hollywood Forever Cemetery, um, and we ended up producing there three times. Um, so with that, with Slither was our third show in that space, mm-hmm. and 
well, I I agree with you. It was a, it was a you know it was a beautiful play, and were it was a great experience. We had a fantastic cast and director, but we were kind of at that point stretching what um, what we could do with that space. Mm-hmm. Um, our whereas our first production in Hollywood Forever, Three Sisters, it was just you know a, a perfect fit between play and space. Mm-hmm. Um, I think by the time we did Slither, we it was we were sort of stretching the concept a little bit. Mm-hmm. So after that, we decided to take a break from Hollywood Forever. And since then, we've really, um, and we still have a really great relationship with them and mm-hmm. um, produce events there from time to time. Um, but since then, we've really been focusing on finding a new space uh, with each, well, I wouldn't say with each productions, but continuing to 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 move to new spaces around um, town because we have uh, we've also found that our audience really likes going to new places, mm-hmm. following us to new places mm-hmm. rather than coming back to the same place multiple right. times. I sort of hesitated there because we are doing a second production this year at uh, uh, St. John's uh, Cathedral in mm-hmm. um, West Adams, but this year it's a flash festival of short plays, and last year we did Diet of Worms there, so it's a very different kind of way of using the Right, same and space. Tom Jacobson's play, that seemed, like, that belonged in, that that seemed like a kind of a melding between yes, yes. script and place, yeah. right? And then that's sort of the concept behind Chalk's Flash Festival mm-hmm. every year, like these two things come together yeah, we we in the Flash Festival we ask uh, usually fifteen writers to write a uh, ten minute plays specifically for a space, and we sort of we'll we'll t- we'll have to find a space with multiple locations within it so we can divide up the space um, into sort of quadrants, and the audience can move through it. With each each weekend, we do five of the plays and sort of move the audience through the space, um, and we did that at uh, the Page Museum at the La Brea Tar Pits, and the last one was at um, Eighth and Hope, the mm-hmm. uh, brand-new luxury high-rise downtown, which got and that was in. I mean, that was, right, full disclosure, I, was, I participated yeah. in that. <laughs> um, that was such an incredible experience, and it felt, it felt, I mean, I think, I guess they all sort of feel quintessentially Los Angeles. Yeah. That one certainly felt quintessential L.A. to me because of um, the culmination on the rooftop, mm-hmm. sort of like the – the. it felt like a Los Angeles apartment building. Yeah. Uh, and like a story being told uh, in the lobby and how the street was utilized and you're in downtown. I just really loved the experience of – And even the name of the building, 8th and Hope. I mean, yeah. it's the intersection, but it's like mm-hmm. – it's right. It's right at this middle of this gentrifying neighborhood, right? Right. And, oh, it's yeah. really a moment of of tension. And I was really impressed that the developers wanted us to explore that tension. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they wanted to take a look at all the scripts, um, and I was sure they were going to be um, critical about the way, or or they would want us to not be critical about their building. Um, and I don't think. You know, obviously, it's a beautiful building. There's no question right. it's a beautiful building. Right. The only thing to criticize is the idea of gentrification and what is happening to downtown and um, with money coming in. Right. Um, but they didn't uh, have a problem with that. The only thing uh, they they commented on were plays that used um, sexually explicit language, mm-hmm. um, and that was just out of a concern for... Um, non-audience members who might be wandering through the spaces. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> so I hope that, that, and that seemed fair. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that was their prerogative. Um, but yeah, that space was, that was such an incredible experience. They, um, they were, uh, we had been planning on doing a Flash Festival that fall. We do one every two, every other fall. So it's a biennial event. Um, and, uh, we had been looking for a space and talking about spaces and um, hadn't found one yet. And then we just got an email out of the blue from uh, these developers who said, would you like to do a play in our high rise? Um, and we'd been referred to them by uh, Camille Schenken, at, who was at CTG. Mm-hmm. Um, who basically, they had reached out to CTG and, and, and they had said, oh, 
these are the people right. <laughs> to talk to, which is a great place to be as a theater company to know. Like, oh, yeah. now we are the people. So if anyone uh, has a space that they want theater, want to bring to life with theater, we are we are clearly well, the it's, people. Well, it's actually kind of wonderful that, you know, you started this thing in 2008 and here we are today. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people who are talking about doing a theatrical event or starting a company and they bring up we want to do it in like you know different places and like maybe site specific and i was mm-hmm. just like i was like that's a great idea check out chalk rep <laughs> just so you know they're the ones that have mastered this uh-huh. so just be mindful of that yeah it's cool it's a, it's it's really um it's still fun this is our 20th production um the case of emergency and uh and it's still fun so that's good uh so now that you bring up in case of emergency, I'm I'm curious to hear about your you specifically and your relationship to Chalk Rep as a as a playwright, yeah. and how uh, you're you're going from sort of like a company member, a founder, and um, how you generate ideas for scripts and how you pitch scripts to the company and how that all sort of happens. Yeah, yeah. So. Um that's a great question. I so this is my fourth full length play that I've written with Chalk. Oh, written um, that Chalk has produced. The first three I wrote before we started the company. Um, so Stray, uh, Full Disclosure, and Hell Money. I wrote kind of. I you know obviously I still was tweaking them, but I wrote them before we started, or at least got them started before we started. Um, so. Uh, and were they ri- were those three written with the thought that these would be done in a traditional theater? Full disclosure and Hell Money. W- oh yes, they were all written with the thought that maybe they could be done in a traditional theater, but also they could work site specifically. Mm-hmm. Well, Stray was we ended up doing in a traditional theater, but Full Disclosure and Hell Money. Um, Full Disclosure is a piece that I wrote. It's set in. Um, at homes that are actually on it, it's set in an open house mm-hmm. and the, it's a realtor character who's talking to you talking to the audience as if they're prospective buyers so we produced that play um, in homes that were actually on the market um, so we moved around to different mm-hmm. open houses and um, that is a play that I wrote specifically for Amy Ellenberger who performed it um, and I had thought it might work in a theater but I had also thought this could work in in actual homes um and um so that was kind of a no-brainer to get that to put that in that we did that in our second season it was a one-person show it was an easy production larissa kokerno um who's another one of the founders um directed it so it was basically just the three of us Mm -hmm. putting on this show um and then hell money which was my production in so that was 2010 2011 um I had again written it uh, so that it could take place in a in a traditional theater, but it's all continuous action, one location, four characters, just like this wild ride, um, and it's about ninety minutes long. Mm-hmm. Um, and we produce that one. All takes place in a um, crappy downtown apartment. Um, and we ended up producing that in a loft downtown because it turns out that you can't fit uh, 30 audience members <laughs> into a crappy apartment. Right. And um, right. Uh, so that was kind of like I should have thought that one through. Did you create a crappy apartment in a loft? Yes, exactly. We got this beautiful fashion loft and we created a dingy right. crappy apartment with it. This loft that costs $4,000 <laughs> exactly. a month. Exactly. <laughs> It's used for like fashion shows, right? <laughs> um, and we, the poor owner, was like, <laughs> "You're making it look terrible." We're like that's the point. <laughs> um, so that one, I by the by the time I wrote those two plays, I had been thinking site specifically, um, and then with with in case of emergency, um, which I started writing probably three years ago, um, and I was thinking, okay, I have to write a new play and um, it's time, you know, as we have those thoughts as, mm-hmm. as playwrights, okay, it's time. And um, 
I want to write a new play that I can send out to the world, to the larger market, as it were. Mm-hmm. But I also want to play that if it does not catch on there, chalk can do. Mm-hmm. Because in between, um, in between Hell Money and In Case of Emergency, I wrote another play called The Rubber Room. I wrote it with in that CTG workshop that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was fantastic. I think it might have been the best play that I'd ever written at the time. And um, it had three or four readings, and no one did it. And it went into a drawer, and no one did it. And I sent it out to all my contacts, and I sent it out to the various, you know, sweeps, playwright sweepstakes, and no one did it. And it was really, really disheartening because it was like, this is my best play, and I know it. I know it's good. It's not like, like, we all have plays that we write where, like, I'm not sure about this one, and people are like, yeah, I'm not sure about it. And mm-hmm. you're like, okay, I'll put that in the drawer and pretend I right. never wrote it. Like, we all have, I, I have a dozen of those some, that you sort of start, and you're like, well, I don't know, this is kind of an experiment. And people say, yeah, nice experiment. Um, right, yeah. Can you write me one of your good ones again? <laughs> Man, this conversation sounds so familiar to me. <laughs> <laughs> right? So Rubber Room was not a nice experiment. Like, Rubber Room is a really, really good play that no one ever did. And it, you feel like you feel like everything came together for you for this, for Rubber Room. Yeah, yeah, I felt like it should have a production, like it should, and I just couldn't get, I couldn't get it off the ground. So for In Case of Emergency, for this play, which is the next play that Can I Can we was, pause that for yeah, a second? Yeah, go ahead. Because I'm, I'm, I'm sort of fascinated, we're going to get, we'll get yeah. to In Case of Emergency. Um, running now at Chalk Rep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> talk about this, I don't know, the, the sort of like emotional aftermath of this like like <sighs> what's your relationship to this plane now is this sort of like your <laughs> your your white whale like what do you like no 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 not a white whale it's like it, it happened i don't know it's like a miscarriage <laughs> mm. it's like a, a thing that you're like oh i really thought that that was the one but it's not and so. do you give up on yeah, it yeah totally so is it is it gone from your life forever i mean i i still know what it I still know it's there, and I still love it, and I still know it's a good play, but I wouldn't send it out. And I feel like the moment for it passed. And why? You know? And I think this is—I think this is what is where my curiosity mm-hmm. is, um, because I—I I can't let go. So I'm I, like I, I and I want to, uh, because I have thirteen that need to be let go and sent away. Yeah. Right. Um, how like. Why? Why? How did you identify that this moment came and went, and there's no need to hang on to it, and you can let it go? Well, I just don't know who else to send it to. Right? I just don't know. Like, I send it to all my fans. I send it to the theaters who like my work. I send it to the open call things. Is there anything in the play itself that that places it so specifically in a moment? Yeah, yeah, there is that too. And do you think that has something to do with it? Yeah, I mean, the play dealt specifically with um, the the um, with a teacher who uh, is sent to a rubber room where they were there's basically these detention mm-hmm. centers for children for teachers who've who've done wrong mm-hmm. um and so it it dealt specifically with um with that uh, and um I believe that there's been some I haven't paid close attention but I believe that there's been some action on those um on teachers being warehoused in that way since um, since I wrote the play in 2010 okay. is when I started. Yeah. Um, all right. All right. I can see that. It doesn't help me. <laughs> it doesn't help me let go. No, I think that's like a temperament thing yeah. right there. Like I, you know, I'm a person who lets go of things. You know, that's just how I don't think you can become that. I want to. <laughs> I, so there are so many things. I'm not talking to my therapist right now. So I feel I'm sorry. I'll let, I'll let that. I'll let that. Co- I won't let the conversation go. No. But I'll pin it until Tuesday night when I'm back. Talking that's to her. that's good. Well, the other thing. Okay, maybe the other ex- bit of explanation is that I've been doing this for uh, twenty four years. Mm-hmm. Right. I started writing plays when I was fifteen. 
Um, I've written a lot of plays. I've written a lot of plays that have like never even had a reading, right? Um, I write, I, I've written a lot of plays that I think are great that um, weren't produced. Mm-hmm. Um, that's okay. <laughs> It's the it just gotta keep keep I like sometimes I even really shock myself. I'll go back through old files and I'll go back through old folders and be like, oh, Whoa, I forgot I wrote this play. You mm-hmm. know, I was just thinking the other day, I was like, Oh, I have to write a I really should write a one person show for um uh you know, one of the other members of Chalk and then I was just sort of thinking through it and I was like, Oh yeah, and I did. And we did that reading and it didn't quite work. And I just had forgotten that I even never wrote it. Do you come back to it and see if there's still yeah, sometimes. something still alive in it? Sometimes. That could be cultivated. But I like if I were to go into therapy, I'd be like, where are my blocks? Like that I'm like I'm like blocking out the failures, right? Right, right. <laughs> anyway, so it's so like yeah, I it's hard. It's hard with the rubber room because I do feel like that was a really good play. Yeah. Um and it wasn't anything it wasn't anything that I failed at as a playwright. Like, mm-hmm. like, ooh, if I'd only made, done this, or if I'd only made this better. It was just, for some reason, it didn't connect with the right producer. And so there were people in Chalk who were, agreed with me. They were like, this is a great play. Let's do this play. And I had to be like, no, it's not a Chalk play. It doesn't, it's not site specific. It doesn't work site specifically. It de- wouldn't be on mission. It has multiple scenes. It only has one. Uh, you know, it just it just didn't didn't feel like a chalk play to me. And I really it was really hard because I knew it was a good play to keep it separate and say no, we can't stretch our mission to fit my play just because my play can't find a home elsewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, instead, what I did was write a play that I did send out into the world, but I also knew that we could do. And that's in case, in of, case emergency. of emergency. Yeah. So it's like, here's a play that could work on a stage, you know, and that's been pointed out. It could work on a stage. Um, but, it'll, but it's even better in a garage. So tell me about it. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's all continuous action. Um, so one night, um, garage door rather than curtain opens. Um, on a woman who has filled her garage with every potential supply that she might need um, for you know, potential calamities that may b- befall her. Mm-hmm. Um, and she has invited a prepping expert to evaluate her preparedness because uh, she needs some outside validation and help because the garage is just full. And um, this is a person who is an expert in the field of emergency preparedness? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Um, He's a veteran. He's uh, this is his like new job is going around helping people prepare, um, and uh, uh, and her sister, the main character's sister, uh, comes into this this room and um, she has some personal emergencies going on, and um, it's sort of and she doesn't believe in that anyone should prepare or have anything. Um, she's much more of the mindset that like the best way to be prepared is to have no attachments. Mm. Um, so it's ultimately the play is sort of this debate between, um, the sisters about, you know, what it means to be physically versus emotionally prepared. Um, and it all sort of unfolds on an evening when there is an actual fire in the city. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the prepping expert has a real emergency that the women have to have to deal with. Where are you in that in that debate? <laughs> like, what's your truth? Uh, I'm much more. Like I said, I don't hold on to things. I'm much. I err much more in the side of, uh, uh, you know, just just let it all go um, and walk oh. away. <laughs> uh, but I. At the same time, I'm a person who always is always thinking three steps ahead. Mm-hmm. So, I guess I'm somewhere. Do you have an earthquake kit? I do, yeah, but only because I wrote this play. Really, <laughs> the play came first. Yeah, no, actually, like the play came <laughs> uh, probably a year in advance. It wasn't until I started buying um, 
we started needing props for the play, and I was like, oh, I'll just buy everything from my house, and we can use it as props. <laughs> <laughs> we can use these things as props, and then at the end, they can go and be my my actual kit. <laughs> and so you have, so now you have these supplies. Yeah. Right. Do you feel? Well, right now they're in on the set, but I'll have them. Right, I'll like, have them back at the oh, end. Oh shit! Let's not like let's not need them. But is it bring? Is has it has that changed? Anything about you? Have you do you f- have uh, yeah. do you feel more at ease that you have these supplies now? No, no. But I'm not. Um, I'm not a super anxious person. I would say so. That part of this writing this with this play was to try to understand the anxious mind mm. um, because I'm. I'm not a super anxious person I'm 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 always expecting the worst <laughs> mm-hmm. um and when it doesn't happen it's like oh awesome <laughs> <laughs> what a joy what a gift <laughs> the worst didn't happen um you know and it's probably just the way I was raised my parents were constantly telling me that like nuclear holocaust was going to happen any day um so I was waiting for I was waiting for the bombs to fall, and they never fell. Um, I think so. I think that's the truth for a lot of <laughs> people who uh, grew up while uh, the Cold War was still yeah, going on. Yeah, yeah. And I was in Canada for my early childhood, so it was like the Americans and the Russians are going to blow each other up, and look where we are on the map. We're right between them, right? So. Oh, right. And then all the Americans are going to try to move to Canada. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to to have non contaminated air. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. I just feel like so lucky, and and also you know, there's yeah, there's just a lot of a lot of wonderful things and a lot of love in my life. So it's like if it all like what what's the worst case scenario? I'm constantly thinking what's the worst case scenario, and I get to the end of it, and I'm like, oh, well that's okay. You know, it is okay. And I think that's a good I think that's a good button yeah. for us. I have a lot of thinking about uh letting go. That I'll I'll continue off mic. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Yeah, I'm happy to. Thank you for coming into the studio, Ruth McKee. Her play In Case of Emergency is produced by Chalk Rep and is running through the rest of June. Visit chalkrep.com for locations and tickets. Thank you to all the people who make this podcast go. Bill Bordy for the financial support to keep At This Stage magazine chugging along. Danny Oliver for being the boss. David at JTB Studio for recording us and making us sound great. And thanks to your moms and dads. Thanks to you for listening and saying nice things about us on iTunes. Tune in next month when I take the Cinnamon Challenge. 